Hi, everyone. Welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, the Global Thought Network at the intersection of finance, technology, and geopolitics. Uh, SALT Talks are a series of digital interviews that we've been hosting in lieu of our in-person conference, the SALT Conference, which takes place annually in Las Vegas, and we've done several international conferences as well in Abu Dhabi, Tokyo, and Singapore. And what we try to do at our conferences and what we're trying to do here with these SALT Talks is provide our audience a window into the minds of subject matter experts, as well as provide a platform for big, important ideas and discussions on what we think are very uh, compelling investment opportunities out there in the marketplace. Uh, today, we're very excited to host a talk about structured credit markets, which are near and dear to our heart. Structured credit markets uh, suffered a severe dislocation in March as a result of the pandemic and the ensuing economic shutdown, uh, but they've started to recover. And for today's talk, uh, we're welcoming on three experts in the structured credit space uh, to talk with SkyBridge Co-Chief Investment Officer and Senior Portfolio Manager Troy Gajewski. I want to provide a brief introduction uh, to our three panelists, which are Clayton DiGiacinto of Exonic Capital, uh, TJ Durkin of Angelo Gordon, and Chris Hinteman of 400 Capital. And I'll go through a bio for each uh, panelist before I turn it over to Troy. Uh, Clay DiGiacinto is the founder and managing partner of Exonic Capital, an investment management firm focused on structured credit and systematic fixed income opportunities. He serves as the chief investment officer for the firm's investment funds and commercial lending business. Uh, prior to founding Exonic in 2010, Clay was responsible for building out the mortgage investment platform at Tower Research Capital and was the senior portfolio manager for Split Level LLC which is the predecessor fund to the Exonic Credit Opportunities Fund. Uh, from 2002 to 2008, uh, Clay was a vice president in the fixed income currency and commodities group at Goldman Sachs. And uh, previously, Clay served as an army ranger and a captain in the US Army in the 25th Infantry Division from 1995 to 2000. Uh, he, he joined the army after attending West Point. Uh, he's a graduate of West Point. He also holds an MBA from the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. He's on the board of directors for Team Rubicon, a great charity that we've featured at the SALT conference before. We'd like to thank Clay for his service and for his ongoing philanthropy work supporting uh, veterans and their families. Um, TJ Durkin is the co-head of Structured Credit and the head of residential and consumer debt at Angelo Gordon, a privately held alternative investment firm founded in 1988 that manages approximately a 35 billion across a broad range of credit and real estate strategies. TJ joined Angelo Gordon in 2008 and is a member of the firm's executive committee, as well as the co-head of the firm's structured credit platform. He's the co-portfolio manager of the firm's residential mortgage and consumer debt securities portfolios, uh, the CIO of MITT, M-I-T-T, and Angelo Gordon, which is Angelo Gordon's publicly traded mortgage REIT. And uh, he serves as a board member of ARC Home, Angelo Gordon's affiliated mortgage originator, and GSE licensed servicer. TJ began his career at Bear Stearns, where he was a managing director on the non-agency trading desk. Uh, he earned his bachelor's degree from Fordham University and currently serves as a member of the school's president council. He's also a board member of VE International, a not-for-profit focused on preparing high school students for college and careers through skills learned in an entrepreneurship-based curriculum. Uh, finally, our third panelist today is Chris Hinteman, who is the founder, managing partner, and chief investment officer of 400 Capital, which is a structured credit asset management firm offering qualified investors access to a broad range of investment solutions across the structured credit space. Uh, Chris founded 400 Capital in October of 2008 and heads the firm investment and operating committees. Uh, prior to 400 Capital, Chris was the head of global structured products at Bank of America Securities. Uh, before that, he spent time trading and investing in structured credit markets at Solomon Brothers and Credit Suisse First Boston. Uh, Chris is a graduate of the Carroll School of Management at Boston College with a Bachelor of Science degree uh, in finance. Hosting today's SALT Talk, as I mentioned, is Troy Gajewski, who is a partner, senior portfolio manager, and co-chief investment officer at Skybridge Capital, which is a global alternative investment firm uh, that's focused on multi-manager hedge fund solutions. Uh, Troy is a graduate of MIT. And just a reminder to everyone, if you have any questions for any of the panelists during today's talk, you can type them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your video screen. And with that, I want to turn it over to Troy Gajewski, who's going to conduct the interview. Yeah, thanks so much, John. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today. 
you know, before we get into the meat and potatoes of uh, structured credit markets, we wanted to give each of the panelists the chance to talk about a little bit about their background and their firm in more depth, and particularly on the human side, how they made the journey from where they grew up uh, to where they are today. Um, so, Clay, if you don't mind leading off in that, we'd love to hear that uh, story. Sure, Troy. Thanks for having me today. Um, I guess I have a little bit of an irregular background. I uh, I graduated West Point. I came from the Midwest, uh, Southern Illinois, and uh, post my mechanical engineering degree from West Point, I served as a military officer in the United States Army uh, as a field artillery officer stationed out in Hawaii. That was in the late 90s. It was a different army back then. It was uh, certainly pre 9-11. And uh, I'd always wanted to go to Wall Street and, and sort of try my risk appetite uh, through uh, trading financial instruments. And I thought the perfect conduit to that was through business school. So I went to Wharton and uh, I started on the mortgage trading desk uh, at Goldman Sachs back in 2002. They, uh, they gave uh, associates fresh out of business school a fairly low risk uh, job to perform, which at that point in time in the mortgage department was the adjustable rate mortgage desk um, because it was, it was relatively low duration. It was hard to lose a significant amount of money in, in uh, relatively low duration assets. But uh, as luck would have it, the curve steepened out quite a bit in 2003. And uh, that was really the advent of all of the affordability products. Um, uh, adjustable rate mortgages, three ones, five ones, seven ones, 10 ones, even the negatively amortizing mortgages that we can all sort of chuckle about today was uh, quite, quite heady back in the uh, early to mid uh, 2000s time environment. But uh, managed a position sort of anywhere between, you know, two to almost $10 billion of both loans and securities, um, all parts of the capital structure, including cash and synthetics, um, and both on the agency as well as non-agency side of the business. And uh, most people that remember the last global financial crisis that were in the mortgage business uh, know that it happened really in 2007, not 2008. And so post uh, 2007, um, I thought what a great time to become an entrepreneur and take advantage of some of the dislocation during the last financial crisis. And uh, that's when I went out on my own, uh, left Goldman and uh, started my business. Um, as it was introduced, I started at a, a firm called Tower Research Capital and launched a split level LLC, which frankly is the, uh, the predecessor fund to what we're running uh, today. Firm is about uh, 55 people. We're based in Midtown Manhattan. We invest in all parts of structured credit, um, RMBS, CMBS, CLOs, uh, multitude of asset-backed securities, even some uh, 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 equities if they're um, uh, balance sheet heavy like REITs or BDCs. Um, and uh, we manage a little over $3 billion in assets through public and private vehicles. A great, Clay. That's a great uh, summary of your background. Are, are there any, uh, you know, skills in particular in the military you learned that you think are applicable today to you as you're managing Exonic, particularly in times of stress? Well, listen, I, I think these businesses, uh, risk management is probably the uh, number one function that everybody on this panel um, thinks is their highest priority. Um, and that's, that's uh, also critical in the military as well. Um, I think that you know a lot of my friends and, and uh, former classmates from West Point uh, serve careers, and, and frankly, um, a lot of them are still in, and have succeeded uh, going up the ranks in the military. Some today are even a general uh, or even a very senior colonel, and they've um, been great risk managers throughout their career, including in uh, uh, operate uh, operating in combat. You know, I, I never had that uh, opportunity. Um, you know, I left the military uh, before 9-11 and before we've been engaged in, in uh, you know, years worth of wars. But I do think risk management is a skill that can transfer across, um, you know, from the military to finance. And that's really thinking about and receiving and um, uh, considering uh, imperfect information in everything that we invest in, trying to make mission critical decisions around that. Um, which is exactly what happens in the military. But more importantly, um, if you're wrong or if there's some bit of information that comes uh, that makes you want to change your mind, you can act on that decisively and uh, accordingly. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, thanks for that summary. 
Clay, really appreciate it. Now, Chris, do you want to give us a little background, uh, a little info on your background as well as uh, the firm? Yeah, I, it, you're gonna you're gonna get a lot of same, similar crossover themes to uh, Clay, so I'll uh, I'll try to keep it somewhat brief because Clay hit on a, a number of things that probably will carry over for all of us. Um, but uh, to make it a little personal, I did actually uh, almost actually 30 years to the day uh, I started in the business. I got out of school in um, May of 1990, and uh, I started uh, what is what was first Boston Credit Suisse in June of 1990, and. Uh, for better or for worse, I think it's for better. Uh, this is pretty much all I've been doing. I, I landed on the uh, mortgage trading desk at, at First Boston in the early 90s, uh, a very interesting time because it was really at the front end of a lot of uh, mortgage securitization. And uh, particularly, I was working on a desk that was, work, was uh, focused on derivatives. So it gave me a really interesting uh, introduction to uh, the mortgage and securitized product uh, universe. Um, I spent uh, four years there. Um, and then, um, and then got an offer to go to Solomon Brothers, which is uh, was a ex really exciting place to work, particularly to be in the bond trading business at Solomon Brothers in the mid '90s. And, uh, and so I traded uh, for a few years at Solomon Brothers, and then um, and then left to go to uh, uh, what was Nations Bank in the mid '90s with one of my colleagues uh, to help develop the uh, Securitized Capital Markets Group for what is today Bank of America. And I spent almost 12 years there. Um, you know, fascinating experience. It was it was in the late '90s and early 2000s when the banks uh, were pretty much given a license as uh, Glass Steagall was was effectively repealed, and to expand into more investment banking related uh, functions. And uh, we developed a business around it where we could use all the uh, uh, the um, strengths of a bank uh, and all the basically the skills that we had, uh, structuring and trading and understanding how uh, securitized finance. Uh, fit into the capital markets with banks and basically the broader financial universe um, and, and help develop uh, the origination, the structuring, the trading, and even some of the proprietary lines of business across uh, res all the residential mortgage uh, spaces, commercial real estate, uh, all the different asset backed groups and, uh, and structured credit and credit derivatives such as CLOs, uh, both in the US and, and in Europe. So it was, uh, I consider that really actually one of the, the one of the really important foundations for what we do because similar to Clay, I had, you know, very, I think we both basically liked, we, we knew we had a differentiated skill. Uh, I think we liked to manage risk and, uh, and, and had a pretty good knack for it. And also realize that, you know, there's, there's a lot of value in actually being in these markets, particularly through cycles, uh, credit cycles, interest rate cycles, but also the evolution of the product uh, as it became more institutionalized and particularly through a, a cycle like 2007, eight as Clay is, referred to, you, you really see, you know, some of the strengths and weaknesses of how a market uh, develops, evolves. And so it was uh, almost the perfect inflection point uh, for me to do what I really aspire to do was basically leverage all that experience to start a firm similar to like what Clay had done. So I, I launched uh, Foreign Capital in, in uh, October of 2010, uh, sorry, uh, 2012. And uh, we did it on a very modest amount of capital. Uh, as most people can realize, it was, it was really challenging. Uh, but I think it was for the better in the long run. Uh, we started with a, a few million dollars of friends and family capital and developed the hard way uh, off a track record and, and basically sort of the knowledge base of what we, we could deliver to clients, uh, you know, in that post uh, GFC environment. And uh, we've developed a firm today that's just under $4 billion and has a range of different products. Um, and, and again, similarly, we, we really basically, um, interact with clients as a conduit to the structured finance space, uh, offering basically the ability, you know, on um, total return or more patient capital, through more patient capital vehicles, uh, the ability to get access to very unique returns that hopefully we'll, we'll be able to articulate over this next hour um, across RMBS and CMBS and uh, asset-based and, uh, and, and crossover forms of credit markets. Um, uh, so, um, so that's how we got here. Yeah, that's great. Great to hear that, Chris. And uh, TJ, please keep it brief because we're already running out of time. <laughs> sure, sure. Never fun to go last. But uh, yeah, really <laughs> briefly, um, you know, I, I ended up going to a college here in, in New York City um, that gave me the opportunity to uh, have a, an internship at Bear Stearns on, on the mortgage trading desk. So similar to Chris, uh, you know, this is all I've really ever been doing. Um, you know, rose up the ranks there to uh, a managing director on the on the mortgage trading desk. Um, stayed all the way till the end until um, you know JP Morgan merger and had the opportunity 
to uh, continue my career on the sell side um, there if I so chose or, um, you know, thought at that point it would be a really interesting opportunity to, you know, go to the buy side, try something new and really, you know, come to an existing platform such as Angela Gordon, um, but that really was not um, exposed uh, or had exposure in, in the mortgage or structured credit space in any material way. And so, you know, fast forward. 12 years here, um, we have a team of 25 people here that I lead on the mortgage, uh, ABS consumer space, kind of up and down the capital structure, whole loan securities, uh, et cetera. And um, that, that's where we are today. TJ, succinct as always. I gotta love <laughs> it, man, I gotta love it. No offense, Clay, Chris, no offense. Uh, so, so guys, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic and all the chaos in the markets that we've experienced here since really uh, the second and third week of March. Can you guys take us back to January this year and explain to the audience why you were positioned the way you were, long structured credit assets? Um, and I'm going to ask uh, TJ to start out this time, uh, since he went sure. last last time, if that's all right with you, TJ. Yeah, and, uh, and And talk about particularly consumer, uh, ABS, and also RMBS a bit as well, why you thought those assets were were very attractive. Yeah, I think I think stating the obvious, obviously, we came into March with historically low unemployment and, it, and we'd been grinding down towards that rate. And, and what that had been doing uh, in the background over the past probably 18, 24 months had really helped support wages. Um, so as there was a need or uh, for more employees, uh, employers had to effectively pay up to get them. And, and we saw that trend really start, I guess, back in, in 17, 18, and, and, and continue through to where we got to, call it, you know, March 1st of, of, of this year. And really, in particular, we saw a lot of um, tailwinds in the lower and, and medium wage earners, um, which is a large part of, in particular, the consumer ABS market. You know, the, 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 wealthy aren't, the wealthiest debts aren't really securitized. Their mortgages are held on bank balance sheets. American Express on their credit card is, is using their deposits. So that's really when you think about structured credit, a lot of it is, is the middle class and sort of working their way down. And so, you know, we saw quite healthy um, fundamentals there on the income side. On housing, you know, just over the last 10, 12 years, we, we just did not keep up with um, um, household formation. And so there's just, you know, structurally a shortage of uh, particularly affordable housing. And so, you know, when you think about the collateral supporting uh, residential mortgage bonds, it's really what's the value of that house. And it was very hard to construct a, a scenario where we thought there would be uh, material downside uh, in terms of that asset price over the coming you know, two to five years. And so, you know, there was a lot of, um, you know, fairly obvious uh, supports, supports to owning this credit, um, you know, coming into 2020. Gotcha, TJ. Thanks for that uh, that summary. And Chris, if you don't mind, could you talk more specifically about RMBS? Because that's obviously a very large sector exposure for your firm. Um, and feel free to dive into LTVs, equity, you know, uh, FICO slash Vantage scores, et cetera. Yeah, it's, it's going to connect well with what uh, TJ just mentioned. I mean, I think a lot of the things that uh, he had mentioned are, are really the foundation for how we have made the same decisions. Um, you had a very strong consumer uh, that that's in jobs is actually uh, very important to that. And actually, it's, it's even more critical today, you know, in terms of uh, having sort of a view. And we'll talk about sort of like the future. But this is a much different employment environment than we had at the beginning of the year. But a very strong foundation for employment, wages, et cetera. So, uh, so obviously, your your credit to the consumer is strong. Um, we we picked up on a couple things. I will uh, add uh, to it that uh, in the post um, GFC environment, bank regulations, particularly around uh, uh, mortgage credit origination, like qualified mortgage rules, really haven't retreated much. Uh, so they had been well in place. And so you have a good consumer uh, with a good job base at the beginning of the year. Uh, relatively uh, delevered or lightly, like on a historical basis, a, a very balanced balance sheet. Um, we've been in a low interest rate environment for a long time. Uh, so uh, consumers have access to great cost of funds. Um, so debt service coverage actually uh, also was very good uh, at the consumer level. So you, you, had, you had very good features in the consumer. And then the origination of credit, particularly in the mortgage universe around the way uh, rules were constructed um, 
in the conventional market and the private label market, you had actually what we would consider well-disciplined uh, credit origination. Actually, in a lot of cases, we thought it was too conservative and mispriced. Um, and the mispricing comes from not only basically uh, looking at high FICO, low lever consumers in a, in a, in a great consumer-friendly environment, uh, you also had relatively low LTVs in, um, in appreciating housing environments uh, with very good technicals, I'll add that too. Uh, the U.S. housing market still remains about 2 million units short in terms of housing uh, supply versus demand, and we think that's going to that's gonna still exist, and it's what's actually creating a, a sustainable housing environment even through the COVID uh, crisis. Um, and then you have rating agencies. You can't miss the rating agencies because they actually are an important function to credit origination, and the rating agencies after the financial crisis just nearly lost their, their license to rate structured finance deals given basically such the poor performance of the financial crisis. So they have the classic sort of a, a pendulum shift as well, like the banks did in terms of uh, conservative underwriting. And so we saw that a lot of the uh, origination in terms of mortgage credit was very conservative from a ratings uh, point of view. So you, you put all of the, you nest all that together and you actually have a really good, really uh, uh, attractive uh, environment to invest in. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, Clay, one of, you, one of the differences between you and uh, Chris and TJ is you've had more of a focus on the agency uh, CMBS multifamily market. So can you talk about the fundamentals there coming into the year prior to COVID-19? Yeah, sure. It seems like so long ago now. Um, I, 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 would, I would echo quickly what Chris and TJ mentioned. I mean, you know, thematically structured credit uh, is currently and was even before COVID a, uh, a structurally cheap asset class, um, primarily due to the re-regulation of global banks and insurance companies. I think where we tend to invest and, and, and likely where others tend to invest that have private, uh, private money um, is at a part of the capital structure which is uh, really punitive for more, most banks and insurance companies. And, and uh, I call it sort of the fulcrum part of the capital structure or the part of the capital structure that matters most to really being right about the credit. Um, it's not the equity, uh, but it's certainly a first loss or a mezzanine part of the debt capital structure. Um, and that, uh, that is a quite a yieldy asset class. And uh, you know, we get to enjoy making decisions about risk relative to return uh, but, but generally, global banks and insurance companies have to think about risk relative to return relative to regulatory capital. And frankly, nine out of 10 times, that regulatory capital tends to be the constraint. So, you know, I know we're going to talk about how cheap the market is now. Frankly, I think it's cheaper than it was post-COVID. Uh, but it was even a, a pretty interesting buying uh, opportunity pre-COVID. Um, we, uh, probably 50% of our investments are centered around CMBS. Um, and commercial real estate uh, with a, a significant bend to multifamily. Um, it, uh, we're experts in com commercial real estate, uh, equity, all the way through the debt tranches. We even have a, uh, an origination business where we will lend on, uh, on the mezzanine part of the capital structure, often behind bank first lien uh, mortgages. Um, but what I think is interesting is, um, given the universe of CMBS, we've never invested in one conduit uh, CMBS B piece, but we highly favor uh, multifamily B pieces, and in particular uh, agency multifamily B pieces. And, and we have a uh, we have a relationship with Freddie Mac uh, on their small balance uh, B piece program. This is a program that was originated back in sort of 2014 2015. It's uh, they originated about eight billion dollars a year um, in general. These are, uh, you know, all of the loans are following the Freddie Mac guidelines, which are fairly stringent throughout the country. There, there's different underwriting guidelines depending on what pocket or, or specifically, as we all know, uh, real estate is hyper local, specifically what geography they're originating in. Uh, all cash flowing assets, no, uh, no development, no brownfield, no greenfield, uh, no transitional loans. Um, with occupancies certainly greater than 90. But, but what I think is, is most important and really the reason why we were very attracted to, to this is uh, small balance multifamily loans in particular, it's sort of the workforce housing. These are you know, 20 to 50 unit garden style low rise apartments geographically dispersed all throughout the country. And uh, th these loans are being made um, not from a lender that, that's really focused on 
uh, driving profitability. Um, this is a policy decision. And, uh, and, and, and both Freddie and Fannie uh, have a, uh, also have a regulator in the FHFA that you know, has a dual report to Treasury and to Congress. And, and specifically, housing affordability um, is a number one mandate, and, uh, and that includes multifamily lending. Uh, let's make loans uh, affordable so that um, housing becomes affordable for, uh, for the multitude of, of renters. And we specifically like uh, uh, the workforce because we thought it was pretty defensive from a macroeconomic uh, um, viewpoint. You know, we, we've been in expansion now for, uh, for 11 or 12 years. Um, I would say that, that credit may feel a little bit toppy or heady. Um, you, you know, we think about the cash flow profile of the asset. We, we invest in uh, discount dollar price assets that you know, pay us back money over time. And we want to make sure that every dollar we put out, um, we're going to get that money uh, in an amortizing fashion over time and, and make sure that we get more, more back than a dollar. So um, you know, our ethos at our firm is, is let's invest in cash flows and make sure that we get the cash flows back and, and, uh, and generate an, an agreeable return. And it's not one where we're focused on spread. Um, meaning very few people at the firm, at least pre-COVID, would think about, let's invest in an asset that we think can tighten because it's just, it's just cheap. Um, we really want to be comfortable with the cash flows. We know that we're going to buy um, the first loss piece on the debt uh, in, these, in these multifamily loans with uh, Freddie origination standards. And uh, you know, if, if, you, um, if you go back to the last crisis, and, and I think there's a lot of parallels from this crisis to the last one, um, we want to be safe around uh, uh, defaults and, uh, and performing assets versus non-performing assets. Uh, Freddie originated multifamily through the last crisis. Um, uh, you know, Hume defaults were less than 50 basis points. I mean, that's incredible when you think about conduit defaults, which were north, north, well north of 10% during the last crisis. And I think we're seeing the same thing this time. Um, just given the data over the past few months, which I'm sure you're going to ask me a little bit about later. Perhaps we'll get into that. So uh, succinctly, uh, TJ, if you don't mind, could you walk our uh, viewers through some of the crazy price action that we saw, particularly the last two weeks of March, um, and what you thought drove that? And then in turn, how much of that price action do you think was technically driven as opposed to fundamentally driven? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I go back and forth with it now, sort of 90 days later, but it felt like we hit sort of the bottom March 23rd, March 24th, at least in our market. And I can tell you, I was sitting in the same seat, you know, starting in 2008, 2009 for the last version of this. And, you know, it felt, it felt completely different in the sense of, you know, that was a slow moving train of deteriorating fundamentals um, Chris brought up rating agencies were flawed. They were kind of playing catch up with downgrades. Um, and I would tell you, most people were, I would say on the, you know, buy side, getting excited about buying assets during that time period. Um, you know, versus this time around, you could tell it was, you know, I don't want to say completely technically driven, but 90% of the price volatility we saw was just technically driven. It was, mostly driven by the daily liquidity, you know, bond, fu bond funds, the mutual funds, the 40 act funds that were getting redemptions. And, and I think it's pretty clear we've been living in a low interest rate environment. Um, people don't really keep their assets in their savings account anymore. It's, it's in these bond funds to get some more yield. Um, the virus uh, caused panic, it caused fear and people wanted that liquidity. And so they pulled uh, assets from those bond funds and they, those managers just needed to sell. It, it wasn't about making a decision of um, relative value. It was sell anything that you can get a bid on. We saw um, just irrational um, prices being reported um, intraday, day over day. Um, and, you know, obviously we're, we're heading into a, a worse employment situation, economic situation, but, um, where we saw what I call bomb proof bonds, AAA bonds, you know, being, you know, for lack of a better term, puked out um, just because someone needed cash um, really kind of told you that it was way different than the last time around and almost, you know, predominantly all technically driven. So would it be fair to say we basically got 08 
an entire year of 08 price action in two weeks? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we got that in two to three weeks versus what probably took 15 to 18 months last time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And you think roughly 90% of that was technically driven? Uh, I mean, I go back and forth, you know, if we were yeah. sitting there in March, 75%, the further we yeah. get away from it, it feels more, more like 90, 95. So I'll stick with my, with my 90. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, uh, Chris, you know, since the dark days of, uh, of late March, you know, all of your portfolios have rebounded quite substantially. Um, what do you think has driven the, the rebound? Is it principally technicals? Is it fed policy? Is it that fundamentals haven't gotten as bad as people feared? Uh, is it some of the fiscal stimulus in terms of the direct stimulus checks as well as uh, enhanced unemployment? When, when you go through the factors that you evaluate each security with, what, what do you think has been the key driver of the rebound so far? Um, if I had to give it one word, it's information. Um, so how, what, what information is, comes into the market that allows you to basically invest prudently and the first piece of information that came in really in those on March 23rd was that the Fed was going to open up QE4. Um, we've seen this before. This is an easy playbook and structure of finance. Buy mortgages. Don't look back. I mean, mortgage basis moved three points, three points in 48 hours. It's unprecedented. So the Fed came in and they said, we are going to do whatever it takes, unlimited, to basically make sure that we actually can transmit affordable financing to the largest basically borrowing base, which is a residential uh, market. Pretty significant. So that's kind of like the first, that's the first driver of the rebound. And then things fall off of that. So then you have the policies that come off of that, you know, within probably a week or two, three weeks after that. Again, further information comes to the market because the first piece of information we all, we all pretty much didn't know was what TJ was just reflecting on, was how much is technical, how much is really fundamental. We're all redialing all of our, our models to say how much impairment is really embedded in these markets. And so while we're doing that, the Fed is, is feeding us new information. Um, so within things that are very relevant, and there are very few of them that are relevant to the structured finance markets, unfortunately, uh, were, were programs like TAU. And you know, even the CARES Act, as it started to develop, helped our markets because feeding uh, cash flow into the consumer uh, or uh, PPP, feeding uh, you know cash flow into small businesses to put a floor under employment, ideally you know a few months down the road, is helpful in a first or second order way for a lot of our our credit decisions. Um, you know, corporates, high yield municipals had much more uh, first order support from the Fed this time around than the GFCs, probably rightly so because industries were really, really under duress in a very, very short period of time. So all that came into the market, I would say, in the late March, early early uh, April, again, feeding more information in the market. And you could see basically, as TJ had mentioned, uh, the higher part of the, of the, uh, the more liquid, the more uh, bond proof, using TJ's analogy, uh, parts of our market uh, recovered pretty quickly. The easier, easier trades were after you got done buying government guaranteed mortgage-backed securities, you go and buy the triple A's, you buy the double A's, you buy the single A's. Um, and that's where you're going to get liquidity. It's where you're going to get your your your, uh, your best trade, so to speak. Thereafter, then, you know, ideally, you're going to try to, you're going to get enough information uh, from the market in terms of like what sense uh, will we get? Will this be a V? Will it be an L? Uh, will it be a V? Will it be a U? Will it be an L? Uh, what are the magnitude of, of, of employment? What's the magnitude of unemployment going to be? Um, what's it going to do to housing and asset prices? So I think, you know, we've gotten a lot of information in the last few uh, months, and I think it's allowed a lot of us to actually sort of really, with, with, with our expertise, dive into the mezzanine and the lower parts of the capital structure and parse through what are exceptional opportunities, because what's, what's evolving is you're seeing that some of these things that we, we spoke about very early uh, in terms of our are at the beginning of the year forecasts uh, are still in place. You know, the, like I mentioned, technicals in the housing market, if, if anything, they've, they've probably gotten, they've tilted more in our favor. Uh, that's, you know, the cost of financing uh, real estate assets has actually become very attractive. Uh, cash flows are feeding through to the consumer that we're seeing that the actual data in terms of uh, auto payments and other consumer receivable payments, and even mortgage payments are uh, moderating. Um, so we're getting more information, in the, and so it, it's able, those are the drivers to get really right to it, Troy. 
that are allowing us to basically start to feed capital in and, and make uh, uh, prudent decisions. I think the hardest ones are going to be how our operating companies uh, or more operating related uh, uh, exposure is going to basically react. It's going to take a longer time uh, to determine. So things like how is uh, consumer behavior going to affect how hotels and people are going to travel or uh, retail, you know, those are kind of the, you know, airlines, um, those are going to be the challenging longer uh, uh, um, recovery cycle subsectors as, as, as I think most people intuitively uh, figure out. But again, it's information as it's coming into the market, you know, as soon as we can digest it and make a prudent um, decision, we can pick through things that are truly just technically repriced and, uh, and make good investment decisions and take advantage of the rebounds. And then Clay, you want to speak briefly about uh, multifamily, you know, how much is technical versus fundamental. Obviously the, uh, the level of rent payments has hung in there much better than people thought. Um, you've had some spread tightening back from the wides. You want to give a little color around that? Yeah, sure. Uh, you, you asked a very good question um, that I've been processing now for a few months. And, and that's, you know, was the sell-off technical or was it fundamental? And, it, you know, I, I think TJ did a great job of explaining to it. But, but the, the, last, the last two weeks in March was one of the strangest trading environments I've ever incurred in my career. And, and if I were to- One of, one of, Clay? One of, one of. Okay. Um, if, if, if I were really to try to set the stage or, or, or frame what was happening, you know, mid-March, the entire Wall Street was work from home and, and nobody was prepared for that. Every single bank on Wall Street has massive disaster recovery centers with fancy computers and multiple screens. Nobody's used to work from home on unrecorded, phone, you know, on their cell phone and on iPads, which they can't really, they, 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 you know, the salespeople aren't interacting with the traders who aren't interacting with other salespeople and really feeling the pulse of the trading environment. And you couple that with being at the end of the quarter, there's a stress for cash. Everybody, uh, you know, most banks that had credit lines outstanding, they were being called upon, right? So these contingent liabilities that were being called upon. And uh, everybody was in cash preservation mode. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of the price action, not only was there daily demand mutual funds that were selling, in, in fact, some of them sold on a Sunday bid list, um, which was also the first, first time, time ever, day. right, Clay? First time I've seen it in my career. Um, uh, but, but also, you know, it was a liability driven issue where, um, you know, repo or margin lenders, um, you know, who also, you know, sort, sort of levered from balance sheets to try to make a spread on, on what their cost of capital was for, or versus where they could lend on assets. Um, that, you know, there was a real uh, margin constraint. And, uh, and, and uh, I think when you look at returns today, um, or, or if you were to try to look at returns over the past few months, you'll see that um, I, I think the differentiated return streams is really a function of how people were levered. And, and those that were most levered probably, you know, did the worst. And, uh, and I think it's important to think about, you know, what was the loss a function of mark to market or was it a function of uh, crystallized um, losses because people had to sell and, and raise cash to pay off margin lenders or, or redemptions if it's a mutual fund, et cetera. Um, and, and, and I think that, I think that March performance or March, March, uh, uh, the, the, the March prices was 90% liquidity, probably 10% fundamental. I, I think we've flip flopped that today, um, where, uh, liquidity is back in the market. You know, repo lenders are back in the market. I think a lot of people have, uh, have changed their, their borrowing book and either reduced it significantly or extended out from a, a, a term and maturity perspective. Um, paying up to lock in uh, term repo. Um, but I also think that the environment that's presented in front of us is significantly different than the last global financial crisis, where, you know, coming out of that crisis, assets were priced yield to worst. That's quite true today. There's many assets priced yield to worst. But what's different is last time, I think you could almost buy anything and, and you saw this recovery um, through both spread tightening as well as fundamentals improving. And when I look at the landscape today, um, certainly on, on all parts of the structured credit market, um, although liquidity is back and you're going to see some spread tightening at the top part of the capital structure, I think there's, there, there is and will continue to be real fundamental stress through the system. And, and like Chris said, you know, we, we effectively get new data once a month. 
Um, and that's data that tells us how people paid or, or what the um, transitional roll rate matrix of defaults was during the last month. And we can infer from that and try to have predictability around the future cash flow profile. But you know, there's, you've probably seen people, you know, there's been tens of billions of dollars raised for their sector right now, uh, which I think is quite interesting. But, but the, 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 the investment philosophy cannot be one where it's just buy it because this is a replay of the last crisis. And I think that's really important to, to know and understand. Um, you, you know, I know that the three of us on the panel, um, we, I, I feel like comfortable saying this because I know that we all have systems. We've been in business 10 years. We have uh, d default and prepayment models that are, that are pretty dialed in at this point in time. And that's gonna help us make decisions to the future, uh, you know, for the future cash flow profile of some of these assets. Um, the buying opportunity is as good as we've ever seen it. Uh, you know, lots of assets are traded at 50 cents on the dollar. And that's not, be, you know, it's not traded at 50 cents on the dollar because um, uh, there's a general consensus that, that, that the principal balance will lose 50%. I think it's trading at 50 cents on the dollar because people are really uncertain what's going to happen. You know, uh, half can, can pay off at par and, and, and half are, are going to go to zero. And that's a tremendous opportunity for folks um, with models, with analytics that have, that have, have uh, invested in this asset class for a long time, you know, certainly coming out of the last financial crisis. You, you talked about multifamily, if you give me a, a few more seconds. Um, the, the idea that we can now buy assets at a, at a yield to worse mentality, and that means that we can ramp up expected defaults, um, we can slow down expected prepayments, and still buy assets with a mid to high single digits yield, I think is pretty, um, uh, pretty significant. And we haven't seen this buying opportunity for a long time. When you couple that, um, I, I always use this concept called yield to worse. So, so it means that, you know, in structured credit spread or price is the last thing that we think about. We first have to be right about our forecasted defaults and, and, and uh, recoveries and prepayments. And when you make all of your assumptions uh, fairly onerous and you're still able to earn mid to high single digits unlevered return, um, the upside is quite significant. Um, so so we're, we're investing in these type of assets. You know, multifamily, like I mentioned before, uh, I think is, is relatively uh, defensive. Uh, most of the loan, mo most of the assets that are backed by the loans that we own um, are, are trading below replacement value. Um, you know, cap, cap rates are in the, you know, five, six, seven percent, uh, the DSCR, uh, you know, assets are well covered. And, and I think that these forbearance programs are, are really working. You know, the CARES Act, um, which goes through the end of uh, July, uh, is interesting because specifically in workforce housing, where we think the average um, income is around $24,000 uh, a year in that asset class, in, in class C multifamily, the CARES Act is allowing these folks to earn about 170% of their uh, prior weekly employed cash flow. And so there's a lot of excess dollars in the system and, and they're paying their rent. Um, that then is leading the, uh, the, the owners to, pay the, to be able to pay their mortgage. And we're seeing that throughout. So I, I think there's, there's been some um, uh, fiscal stimulus that's been good for the consumer. It's been good for a lot of the asset classes that we're investing in. Yeah, that's great. And I'm always going to TJ for, for succinct. He's my man, you know, but well said, well said. Uh, just give us a few data points, TJ, if you don't mind. Keyword a few on how fundamentals look today, particularly the last two to three weeks versus where market assumptions were or expectations were as recently as four to six weeks ago. Yeah, so I actually don't think that the the market's expectations on fundamentals have been grossly wrong or grossly conservative. I mean, as uh, Chris pointed out, our business is driven off of data. So the more we get, I think the more comfortable we get with, um, you know, the tail scenario of what's the downside that Clay just walked through. Um, a lot of, there's been a lot of talk about mortgage forbearance. So maybe I'll skip that. And, you know, we've been investing um, with a, with a non-prime credit card company. So, a non-bank, they're, they're looking at lower uh, FICO borrowers, mid 600, smaller credit lines. They've been in business since 2003. So they lived through the last um, cycle, if you will. 
Um, and what we saw as, as, as ties exactly out, out to what Clay just mentioned, um, in the months of April and May, um, and it's continuing on, they're, they're, that, the credit card company is getting their highest um, payment amounts in per month. So if someone has an outstanding balance, those, their borrowers are paying it down at a higher propensity than in their you know, now 17 year history. And so um, it's a function of there was, there's not a lot to do, everything's closed. So people are, are, are not spending money per se, and people want the utility of having a credit card. And so, um, you know, for what would consider, be considered a non-prime borrower, um, we're seeing uh, delinquency rates, um, you know, that do not tie out to a, you know, double digit unemployment rate. Um, and so, you know, that is a function of, of the CARES Act and that's a function of um, people generally came into this um, with decent balance sheets, as I think Chris mentioned. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, we can certainly talk about mortgage forbearance rates, et cetera, but that's, that's certainly getting a lot more press than some of the other uh, consumer products out there. Yeah, well, I'll let Chris talk about forbearance requests really quick because that is an important topic, obviously, for the housing market. So could you, Chris, could you briefly describe you know, where markets expected forbearance requests to go to and where they've actually uh, hit a ceiling and have started to decline the last three weeks? Yeah, the, the, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible, uh, incredibly uh, complex topic, quite frankly. Uh, I think everybody is in the spirit of giving um, the consumer uh, firm ground to, to recover uh, from such an unprecedented crisis. So, um, you know, the spirit of, of getting consumers back on their feet, uh, I think we all have to unanimously support. Um, so uh, forbearance is, is really key to that. And so it's giving people the room um, to, uh, to, to, to manage their payments in the short term. And then, um, and then how those plans reverse. And so how many people, uh, what we always call roll rates, how many roll into a true um, delinquency and how many really recover is, is really what we're, uh, is really the, the inflection point of what we have to monitor and, and, and uh, pay attention to. Uh, you've seen, and as you, you alluded to, uh, the data is, you know, it's, it's, it's still, you got to look at, you know, a series, but in the short term, uh, we've seen a slow uh, recovery in terms of overall mortgage forbearance rates. Uh, they've peaked in the overall mortgage market in the mid eight. So about literally roughly about eight point, call it 8.5% of, of U.S. Uh, mortgages uh, were in some form of uh, forbearance. And then, um, then the stratification about, about that 8 point, that 8% um, falls into different buckets uh, depending on what type of borrower you are. So, so we've seen, um, we've seen the, uh, what we call the conventional or the typical uh, uh, Fannie Freddie borrower uh, uh, with you know, roughly around a 7% forbearance rate. And then you get um, uh, Gini borrowers, which tend to have lower FICO scores um, higher uh, uh, higher loan to values, less equity in the homes, um, may actually uh, have less savings and may lower FICOs and may struggle to make payments. Um, those have been in the 12% range. Um, so, uh, so you've seen you know kind of um, different uh, results in terms of forbearance uptake over the last couple months. Um, in the and then in the in the non um, uh, what we call the GSC world, the, the private label uh, mortgage world. Um, you've seen a, a slightly better experience, roughly around 6%, which you have prime borrowers that are you know, roughly around 3%, which is still is shockingly high for a, a, a very prime borrower. And then you have alternatives, which depending on the type of loan product could be high single digits to high double digits. So there's a lot of basically different results in terms of the uptake of forbearance plans. Um, what we have seen is people that even take up forbearance plans have been paying to a certain degree. So I think some people are looking for the, the room, just like the corporates have been doing, the corporates have been hitting the, the primary market uh, for liquidity because they realize they have to create reserves for their business models because they don't know how long it's gonna take to get airplanes back up in the sky, to get hotels back online. So just like what corporates are doing, the consumer's doing as well. And so they're looking for these plans to try to build some safety in terms of liquidity. Um, in the last couple of weeks, uh, we've seen some of that actually recede. So, we're seeing people get a little bit more confident uh, about their situations, and we're seeing some some of that actually start to plateau, which is a really good sign. And uh, and we we optimistically think that that actually um, could improve quite a bit. And um, and I think we as a have a house view, 
that uh, that in this interest rate environment, particularly where you can get a mortgage, uh, conventional mortgage with a two percent handle to it, um, you'll see a lot of people basically want to keep their optionality to refinance uh, mortgage debt. Um, so we, we we would likely see some of that start to recede as people take advantage of the refinancing environment as well. Great, Chris. That's a great summary uh, of the improvement, or at least the lack of deterioration of the data, followed by some uh, improvement so far. Um, all right, guys, we talked about how most of the sell-off was technical. We talked about how fundamentals never got as bad as people feared. We've talked about more briefly than I would have liked about how you know fundamentals have uh, improved from uh, less bad levels. Could we talk now briefly about the path to recovery? And again, it's hard to put numbers around it, uh, but I'm sure our viewers are very interested in hearing what do you think is a realistic uh, return stream? Um, what do you think the upside surprise would be? Uh, what types of, of, uh, of compounding returns and absolute returns can you guys put up you know, over the next six, 12, 18 months? Troy, we think we own, um... We think we own the, 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 the bonds in our main fund uh, that, that you're invested in right around uh, a, a mid to low teens type yield, something like 13 or 14%. Um, is, that that is, is that higher than risk-free, Clay? Is that higher than risk-free? A little bit, right? I mean, you know, we're, I'm sort of myopic within structured credit and trying to think about the micro sectors that are interesting within structured credit. Listen, there's allocators all over the world that have a much tougher job that have to think about structured credit relative to, to, to other assets. And when I think about, um, you know, an, an, uh, an, an aircraft ABS or, or a legacy resi bond or, you know, some of the stuff that we're seeing in commercial right now compared to equities. I mean, you know, it's an equities market where Hertz can go from 75 cents to, to, to 550 or $6 in a matter of a few weeks. I sort of just scratch my head and I think structured credit uh, is, is, is perhaps the most fundamentally cheap sector um, in the investable universe right now. Um, you know, we, we own our book at, uh, you know, mid teens type yield. That's not assuming spread tightening. That's just a function of um, cash flows uh, that will come from the assets that we own, um, both interest and principal. And this is, this, is, this is a great market. We get paid down every single month, right? We, we can, we can do nothing. In fact, tomorrow is remittance day. Uh, the 25th of every month is, is when we find out how uh, the predictability or what we, we assumed would have happened, how, what actually happened during the month of May. Um, so, so we get excited about that. We call it payday. But listen, with, with spread tightening, with mm -hmm. spread tightening, Troy, I, I think a, a very high teens or, or low 20s type net number is, is completely achievable. And, and I wouldn't say just over the next you know, to, uh, you know, 12 months. I think that's sort of like a compounded, like 18 month or, or two year type opportunity. The, the, the path to get there is a little bit more difficult. Um, but I know that staying the course and just receiving these cash flows day, you know, month in, month out is a, is a pretty good uh, way to um, get back our money. Great, great, Clay. TJ, my man. Yeah, I mean, so, so we probably have a slightly different book than Clay, but, um, you know, we see our unlevered assets and the high single digit yield. Um, we, we're probably a little bit more higher in the capital structure and, and we do use um, some leverage in the book. And so if you go back to March, some of those assets were getting marked down given that forced selling that we saw. And, you know, luckily we, we, we were not a, a forced seller and we were able to hold on to uh, almost all of our assets. Uh, and, and we're now seeing that recovery back. So, um, we see kind of a cash on cash yield over the next 12 months in the low double digits. Um, we're running about a four and a half year spread duration. So, you know, if you look at corporates, um, just as, four and as a half the big, year unlevered, right, TJ? Unlevered, unlevered. Yeah. Um, and so if you look at corporates just as, as a natural competing product for, for yield buyers, um, you know, if you, if you pound and pound a hundred base points of spread tightening, um, that's about nine points of total return to a, to a call it, 12, 13% cash yield, again, you can, you can pretty easily see a 20% gross return in a 12 month period. Um, and you're not getting anywhere near the spread levels a uh, hundred tighter that you saw uh, coming into Feb. So, so there's a lot of room in the middle between where we are today and, and saying that you have to get all the way back to February. We're not, we, we don't see that as a necessary um, event to generate those type of returns. There, there's a lot of room in the middle. Chris, how about you? 
I can only support what they said. I mean, I think I think this sector is as attractive as it's been since the uh, last financial crisis, and uh, largely driven from everything we just talked about. Um, no better, there's no better environment to invest in than when um, technicals overwhelm the market, overwhelm the fundamentals. Uh, so, um, obviously, the, the the desperate reach for liquidity in March forced prices so low they went they went below fundamental value, um, and uh, what we always see is that this sector is complicated and it takes expertise to invest in it. You just can't buy the ETF off the shelf and, and basically expect it to bounce back. And so what's fantastic about it, it's frustrating for certain investors. You have to have some patience to it. Everybody asks, so am I going to get the bounce back in April? Well, the good thing is, is that, you know, if you have the patience, you're going to get, you know, the market got repriced due to heavy technicals, as we've all discussed. Uh, the bounce back doesn't necessarily come back in April because, like I said, data and other information has to come out. But as that's coming out, it, you're starting to see this this positive trajectory higher. And so, um, you know, we did make adjustments for what we think are new fundamental forecasts. We all did it. And I think I concur with uh, the, the group here is that even, even making uh, provisions for what is going to be a more challenging recovery environment and the breadth of of outcomes, because I don't think there's one clear, easy path to predict. I do think it's a mid to upper team return. What I might amplify is actually, I think that those are unlevered. Um, and I think that's key, is that a lot of our strategies, as you've heard here, is I think we respect the fact that, you know, putting leverage on top of illiquid or relatively illiquid uh, assets is kind of a dangerous co dangerous combination. So I think what we're describing here is that there's, there's a, uh, uh, this is an asset class trading below fundamental value. Um, you know, there is, um, there's data coming out that supports basically the recovery trends. It will take some time. And it's generally going to produce really attractive returns uh, on an unlevered basis. Great, Chris. Well, guys, I have to hop on a client meeting or a client call. Uh, viewers, we appreciate you, you tuning in and want to thank Clay, TJ, and Chris. Uh, for joining us. And I'm now going to turn over to my colleague, John Darcy, who's going to give Q&A that came in from the audience during uh, our session. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great right. day. Yeah, we have several audience questions. I want to thank the audience for your participation. Um, the first one is about uh, mortgage rates and interest rates. Do you see interest rates going negative? And if so, what impact do you think that would have on the mortgage market and the real estate market? That's a hard one. Um, I, I don't see rates going negative. I think there's plenty of unintended consequences with, uh, with negative rates. I, frankly, I think that zero should be the floor. Um, you know, what's interesting about mortgage rates, and uh, they're, all, they're at all-time lows. I, I think certainly they're at all-time lows in the agency mortgage market. They're at all-time uh, lows in the non-agency mortgage market. I think, you know, for, for your... Um, uh, for, for your audience today, if you can come across, or, or if you can, if you can sort of take with you one thing that you, that you should you should go forward after today is to try to refinance. I, I think rates are uh, rates are exceptionally low right now. But what's interesting about that refinance and the space that we invest in is um, the dollar price that we own our assets. And, and and I just looked at this. You know, pre COVID, the average dollar price of our book was around eighty seven cents on the dollar. Um, still at a discount. Uh, but post COVID, the average price of our book right now is 70 cents on the dollar. So every refinance that, that sort of comes through the system is quite beneficial for the forward cash flow profile of what we own. And, and, and so, you know, perversely, low rates is, is a really interesting um, uh, contributor to positive PL for, you know, discount pools of, of, of mortgage credit. Um, I, I think that the uh, I think that the the Fed will keep mortgage rates low relative relative to the risk free rate, and frankly, I think a lot of uh, you know banks and insurance companies that are trying to match their uh, their, their assets to their liabilities um, love the mortgage asset because it can still have a lot of duration uh, even at these levels. All right, I'll hop to a different question that I'll direct at Chris. Um, it's there's a few questions about the CMBS market that I'll sort of aggregate into one. What do you think uh, CMBS last month had a record default rate of around 8%. What are the implications of that? And then long term, as people look at how they operate their businesses, do you think there will be any long term disruption to new within office buildings? Um, 
I think the answer is simply yes. I mean, I think the, uh, you know, you're seeing it play out as we speak. Um, you know, people are going to think about how office is used and it's, it's going to be used differently in, um, in the short term. Um, right now it's not getting used at all for the most part in a lot of the major MSAs. Um, you know, how people re-enter the office uh, environment uh, is going to be, is going to be to be determined. I mean, right now in New York City, you can only occupy 50%. And then, um, so I, you know, and then, um, and then will, will there, you know, everybody's gotten so good at using basically the work from home environment. I mean, this, this, uh, this panel actually speaks to it. I mean, you used to have this huge uh, production out in Las Vegas and look at you're putting us all on into the same environment very comfortably from our own homes. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. We've all learned to adapt. So it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna direct, you know, sort of how office is used. I think the WeWork model, I don't want to call it long gone, but it's pretty much out of sight for a while. Uh, so, so that, that, that form of it's going to be gone, and there's probably going to be excess capacity, and that's what's going to drive some of these default rates, particularly in office. Um, I mentioned hotel. Hotel is kind of a soft spot. You know, how people travel, how people use hotels is going to be really challenging. It's going to be another uh, part where you can see default rates. Uh, rather high. Uh, retail, again, the same thing. There's going to, retail has been under duress for a long time um, and likely to continue to basically sort of uh, support the uh, default rates. Um, I was mentioning sort of the shortage of, of housing and household formation is positive and people basically are going to need places to live. Um, you know, if the employment, unemployment environment remains high, people are going to look for affordability products like to what Kate Clay was speaking. You know, we have the same view. Multifamily is, is going to be Probably one of the uh, one of the uh, oases in the uh, in the in the um, real estate market. So it's probably one of the most mixed picture pictures in terms of how different forms of uh, real estate um, are going to be used going forward, and it's going to drive all of our decisions in terms of what we decide to invest in. And uh, and I think you know hopefully I gave you some some leading indications in terms of where where we're going to be biased. Yeah, that's great. You know we're we're going to wrap it up with one more question here for TJ before we let you guys go and thanks for doing a little overtime with us. I know distressed credit is not necessarily you know, exactly where you fit in TJ, but we, we have a question about the distressed credit cycle and traded credit and, and whether the, the speed of the sell-off that was you know, liquidity driven as we've talked about and the subsequent recovery, has that the opportunities in the distressed credit space disappeared or do private distressed opportunities make a little bit more sense in this environment? No, so I mean, I, I you know we have a very large distressed business here, and, and um, I can tell that's why you answered my uh, and asked me that question. But um, you know, if you go back to before COVID, you know the the fundamental building blocks of how I think we were investing was um, the consumers in good shape, housing's in good shape, and everyone was focused on um, the quality of leveraged loans, the lack of covenants, the leverage going into the corporate space, um, and and it was it was you know, blinking yellow to say the least. And so, you know, this is only, I think, pulled forward a lot of the balance sheet issues, you know, just like, you know, Chris talked about retail. Retail was a problem before COVID. Obviously, it's been exasperated by it. So I think, you know, you're seeing um, the, the sound investment grade companies that had those sharp technical sell-offs, those opportunities are gone from March. But you're gonna continue, I think, to see a very healthy pipeline of restructuring. Um, that I think, you know, again, we're, we're, we're in the model for maybe 2020, maybe 2021, but people were setting up for it. It just got pulled forward a lot, um, despite, you know, the, the Fed isn't looking to take credit risk. Like, they've made that very clear. They're looking to support the markets. Um, and, you know, I, I think there'll be plenty to do in distrust. All right. Well, thank you for that, TJ. And, and again, Clay, Chris, TJ, thank you for joining us.